All right. So yeah, this afternoon um, I'm going to be covering for the next couple hours some advanced um, mesh generation topics in uh, 3D primarily is what we're going to be sticking with and unstructured and hybrid methods. Okay, because these are going to be the methods that you'll use for very complex geometries like, for example, the external aerodynamics for uh, aircraft. Yeah. So the first thing I'm going to be covering is solid modeling and meshing, and that's basically me going to be talking about geometry cleanup. Uh, it's very rare that the geometry comes in clean, and uh, so I'm going to discuss some of the techniques that we have in PointWise for cleaning that, uh, that geometry up. I'm then going to launch into a discussion about viscous meshing, um, anisotropic tetrahedral meshing to be specific. This is a, an algorithm in PointWise that we use to create um, hybrid viscous meshes. And then I'm going to talk about grid quality and how to identify problems in the mesh, uh, what, these, what these may mean for your solver, talk a little bit about the different metrics that we can look at. And then uh, if I have some time at the end, I'll wrap up with some glitch scripting and comments on automation, specifically talking about the script that uh, we put together to create the FFD boxes for SU2 and um, maybe a couple other utility scripts that I'll be running throughout this process. This is the geometry that uh, I'm going to be using for the entire uh, afternoon, uh, except for one component. We're actually going to um, clean this geometry up, put a surface mesh on it, volume mesh it, look at its grid quality, and uh, also create an FFB box for the spinner. So this aircraft actually doesn't have a spinner included. This is the, uh, the spinner here. And so really kind of our problem definition could be something like, you know, we have this geometry, there's no spinner. With the grid deformation in SU2, what we can do is we can create kind of an approximate representation of a spinner which actually serves a couple of purposes for aircraft. One, for reducing drag, and two, for providing cleaner flow to the engine compartment. Um, this is an electric, uh, electric or gas-powered RC aircraft, so that's going to be pretty important. So we'll create kind of a, um, you know, a, a good representation of a spinner, create an FFD box for that, and then we could pass that off to SU2, okay? All right, so the first thing is going to be solid modeling and meshing, which is uh, geometry cleanup. But before I launch into that, I need to uh, cover some terminology like I did yesterday for pointwise, and this is uh, for geometry specifically. So in pointwise, um, if you bring in a geometry, chances are you're going to be seeing quilts and models, okay? It turns out quilts and models, um, for all intents and purposes, are geometry to you, but they're not. They're just information about the geometry that's actually underneath it, and they're only there for meshing. Okay, we, we create those entities specifically for making meshing easier for complex geometries. Uh, what you would actually find beneath those, as you kind of walk down this stack, is at the base you would see the underlying surface Okay, with some UV parameterization. Uh, above that, you would get trimming curves and a trim surface, which is essentially a subset of the UV parameterization of the underlying geometry. Uh, a great example of this is maybe like a fillet or a round that may have been constructed using a cylindrical surface and trimming curves. Okay, So that underlying surface may be a cylinder, um, and then the trimming curves create a nice filleted or round trimmed surface. And then what we do when we import that is we convert those trim surfaces to quilts and assemble them into models. And a quilt is basically a, um, it's a logical meshing region. So yesterday when we were creating connectors and domains and things like that, today we're going to be working in 3D. A quilt basically allows you to lay up your meshing topology before you even start meshing. So you can get a sense for what the topology of the surface mesh is going to look like just by operating on the quilts. The model is there to, it's kind of the glue that holds all that together. So the model is going to be a watertight representation of those quilts, which means it's a watertight representation of the geometry. Uh, that's beneficial because if you have a watertight representation of the geometry and you mesh it, you're guaranteed that that surface mesh will be watertight. And we need a watertight surface mesh to fill the volume. Okay? So that's the, the terminology uh, for point-wise in terms of geometry. Okay, to give you a, a kind of a clearer picture of this before we launch into point-wise, uh, on the left and right I have um, basically two cartoon quilts. Each quilt consists of a number of underlying trim surfaces, 
each with their own UV parameterization and orientation. And that quilt kind of acts as the glue that holds all those underlying trim surfaces together. So when we mesh on it, each of those quilts is going to get its own domain. And you could imagine these two quilts being in the same model and being stitched together. Okay? So they're kind of a high level overview of how quilts and models will work. Okay, so the first geometry that we're going to be looking at just to um, demonstrate some, some trimming operations, some Boolean operations, and just basic quilting and, and meshing is uh, this generic transport that came from OpenVSP. After this, we're going to jump into the extra 300. Um, so I have kind of a, uh, a, a cleaned up but still yet dirty version of the uh, extra 300, and then we're going to further clean that up and demonstrate how you can create geometry if you need it, and then once we do that, we'll, we'll proceed with surface meshing and volume meshing, okay? So with that, I'm going to launch into pointwise, and we have this generic transport, okay? The first thing that you'll typically do is just grab everything and try to create as few models as possible. So from the create menu, this is where you can create, this is where we um, created our extrusions yester <coughs> yesterday. Uh, it has a lot of geometry tools. In here as well, you can create revolves and sweeps and, you know, coons patches and things like that. So I'm going to assemble models from this to create as few models as possible. Okay, and so I get something like this. Uh, in this panel, I, I see that I have five models, um, no lamina boundaries. A lamina boundary is basically a free edge. It would represent something like a gap uh, on the surface or a hole in the geometry. And I, I'm actually going to modify modify this geometry shortly just so you can see what that would look like. And then a manifold boundary is basically a connection between two adjacent quilts. Okay, so I've got five models and basically what that tells me, each model is a different color, is that all of the components of this aircraft were created separately and are simply just self-intersecting. So there's a model for the wing, a model for the belly pod, one for the tail, uh, the vertical stabilizer, and they're all just kind of intersecting. And so what we need to do is perform um, basically a Boolean operation on all these entities to remove all the internal uh, geometry that is kind of piercing itself, okay? So I'm going to accept that. So now I've got a model for my wing, the pod, basically every entity. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the pod and I'm going to trim it by the wing surface. So I'm going to trim A with B. A was the pod, B is the wing. I'm going to keep the outside of both of them and I'm going to trim them with each other and click imprint and OK. And you'll notice now the wing has been trimmed. It's no longer piercing uh, through the belly. Is this geometry available somewhere? Um, or are we just watching it? It, you're, I, maybe I should have mentioned. So today, um, a lot of the concepts I want to cover, I'm going to go through relatively quickly. So you guys probably won't be able to follow along unless you really, really want to. We have a recording, so you can kind of watch that afterward. But this geometry is on the FTP site that I listed yesterday. Okay. Yes. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. <coughs> no, this is in the latest version of OpenVSP. Um, it can directly export step files. Um, Rob McDonald and I will be giving a talk at the Pointwise User Group meeting uh, this month, or sorry, in October, uh, talking about this uh, this work. Okay. So the next step is I'm going to uh, trim the fuselage by that pod. So I'll basically do the same operation, imprint, and then I'm going to take that fuselage and I'm going to trim it by the tail. And then once I'm done with that, I can just grab everything and I can reassemble that model. And you'll notice now that I have a single model with no lamina boundaries. And so I have a watertight representation of my aircraft. So it's a good habit that if you have a a solid of some kind to create a watertight model. You don't have to. There are ways to kind of heal things on the geometry level. Go, go ahead. So just to be clear, the mm -hmm. geometry you had originally imported was a step file? It was a step file, with yes. Nerves, yes. Uh, surfaces mm -hmm. and curves, mm -hmm. and it was self-intersecting. Correct. So was exactly. So each of those different colors came in as a different surface. And uh, they were it, we basically converted each of those to a quilt and a model. And then that first step, I kind of tried to combine it into as few models as possible. So this was a nice step file. In the yes. Sense that it was perfectly done. Yes, exactly. And you were able to use the entire functionality on any other kind of surface or presentation that may be done by mm -hmm. very different models. Mm -hmm. 
IDIS and proprietary. Yeah. Add. Yeah, so we can import, um, that's a good point, we can import, the question uh, was uh, pertaining to the different formats, and, and we can import um, things like uh, SolidWorks, ProEngineer, CATIA, and bring along with that some of the data that comes with it. So SolidWorks comes with a solid, we'll import that, and we can work with that. But if it's a surface representation, presumably if it's SolidWorks, it works just as well. Exactly, if it's a surface representation, it works just as well, because then we'll, we'll construct those solids uh, for you. Yes. When you were initially introducing that model, I may have misheard, but I thought you said that the, the highlighted red was referring to a gap or something. Correct. Correct. Yes. Do, do you Is see that closed when you create a model? Well, there were there were no um, red gaps in this model. Um, I'm actually going to create one just to show you what you could do if you had a gap. Um, so I'll, I'll demonstrate that in just a second. Um, so yeah, at this point we have a watertight representation of the aircraft. So that's a good point. The, the you know there was a question raised about you know what if I had a gap. Um, so why don't I go ahead and create one? Um, I don't recommend creating gaps in your models after you've created them, but uh, for demonstration purposes, let's let's go for it. Um, I'm basically going to trim it by a plane and. Okay, so now we have a gap. So if I grab everything and create the model, now you'll notice that, uh, well, one, you can see I have two different models from the two different colors, and two, you can see I have lamina boundaries in the table, and they're uh, highlighted in red here on the screen. And, yeah, if I rotate this around, there is a, uh, there is a physical gap there. Um, there's a couple of ways to handle that. If the gap is small enough, um, you can heal it directly from the model assembly. There's this edge tolerance, and I haven't touched that yet, but um, what I can do is I can come in here and kind of measure the distance between uh, two points on this gap, get a sense for how large it is, and I can adjust my model or my edge tolerance to something a little bit larger and click assemble, and it's basically healed over that gap for me. So now the gap is gone. Um, you can use this for uh, recovering these, uh, like, or repairing these gaps or holes if they're relatively small. Now, I think that gap was probably too big, so, Sorry, yes, that, go ahead. That was allowing point-wise to choose which edges to meet with the bridge, or can you actually explicitly say just refer these to no, edges that are physically separate, but really were meant to be the same? That's a great question. So the question was, can you pick which edges you want to repair? In that model assembly, you can't. It's kind of a global parameter. <laughs> Um, so yeah, if, if the gap is, is sufficiently large, you can actually, um, I can grab, for example, the, the boundaries and, and um, what I'll do is create like an interpolated surface. So I could create a, a collection of surfaces that fill this gap and then add them to the model to repair it. So that's another way uh, that you can go about doing it. So PointWise isn't a CAD tool. We have CAD capabilities built in to help you repair things. Um, but again, by all means, if you can, you go to go to the CAD guy. Um, this is for those instances where you can't, and you're you're in point wise. You're meshing. We wanted to provide you with some facilities for repairing the geometry as best you can, and sometimes that takes creating geometry to do so. And so those tools are in in point wise. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of that gap. Okay, so now I have a solid model for my airplane. Now the next thing I want to do is I'm just going to uh, I'm going to rotate this, and I need to move that thing out of the way. I'm going to rotate this, so I'm looking down the x-axis, and uh, I'm going to delete half of it. This thing is symmetric. Uh, there's no sense in me cleaning up the whole thing if, uh, if it's symmetric. So I'm just going to grab half of the quotes using that inclusive selection and delete. And then what I'm going to do, rotate this around, I want to quilt quilt this up. Um, right now, each of those colors is a different quilt. And if I were to mesh this, each of those quilts would get a different domain. And maybe that would make sense if I just uh, meshed it. So why don't I go ahead and do that? Um, 0.92, let's pick an average spacing of 0 0.1. And I'll grab the model and put a mesh on it. OK, so if I turn off the geometry, you'll see that uh, each patch got its own domain, okay? And uh, 
<coughs> what you can do is, all right, for the fuselage, maybe four domains is too much. You've introduced too much complexity by having too much topology in the, in the grid. Um, so instead of doing that, why don't we just join some of these quilts together to reduce the complexity of the resulting surface mesh. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to only be able to pick quilts. So these are, we talked about the mask panel yesterday. <laughs> Control M will launch you into more and a more advanced mask panel where you can do a very specific selection. So for example, rather than picking all database entities, I just want to pick the quilts. And then I'm going to set kind of an angle limit for an adjacent selection. So that way I can pick this and do like control shift A and it'll pick all adjacent entities with the turning angle of less than 20 degrees. So it's very rapid selection. And I want all of these quilts to be in the same, I, I basically want to join all these quilts into a larger quilt. So by clicking that, I've essentially joined those into a larger quilt. And if I just grab everything and show you only the boundaries, it kind of hides the internal line. So that's now one quilt. Um, maybe for this, uh, this fairing, I want to grab all those and join those together. Um, the upper and lower surface of a wing, I'll grab the two upper surfaces and join those. Um, the lower surface, I'll grab those two surfaces and join those. And so now I have something that's it better represents the geometry from an engineering standpoint. I have a surface for the upper portion of the wing. I have a quilt for the lower portion of the wing. I have a quilt for the fuselage. Um, this is how simple I want my mesh to be because then I can do more, more with it. So what I'm going to do is now I can create my surface mesh. So I'll pick my model. Default still set. Create my surface mesh. And so now I have a single domain, for example, for the entire fuselage, a single domain for that, a single domain for that. So this is how you can use quilting and solid modeling to your advantage. And so kind of my, um, my procedure when I'm approaching a problem like this is I tend to spend probably more time up front with the geometry than a lot of people. Um, because I know that once I've got everything quilted in a nice watertight model, that meshing is going to be just a few clicks of the button, and I can I can move on from there. Okay. Can you talk about your decomposition process? Decomposition process. We don't have a decomposition process. Are you talking about on export? Oh no no. Like if you're uh, decomposing your model. Oh, that, well, yeah, so uh, the question was, what's my process? And, and that's kind of what I was describing. My process is I try to create as few models as possible. If it's one object, I, I work really hard to get that into one water type model. And then I create quilts that represent physical entities in my model, like a quilt for the entire fuselage. I don't need four quilts to represent one object in this, uh, in this mesh. All right. So that's this example. That kind of demonstrated um, the trimming operations, um, how to use model assembly, how quilting can be beneficial. And now with that, I'm going to move over to uh, working with the extra 300. And we're going to be using the extra for the, uh, the rest of the workshop. So here's the aircraft. Um, it's actually fairly nice if I grab everything. Again, my process, I grab everything, I go assemble models, I click, I need to use default, click assemble, and now I have a model, and you'll notice I actually get six, so those control surfaces are all separated from the, uh, the main fuselage. I've got ten lamina boundaries. Um, you'll notice if I flip this over, there's a couple of holes uh, in the exhaust. Uh, let's see, looks like there's kind of a hole at the uh, bottom portion of the rudder that needs to be patched. So why don't I go ahead and, uh, and do that. So that's a pretty simple process. I can just grab the boundaries of those holes and create some coons patches. Oops. Come back here, do the same thing. Let's deselect that, we don't need it. Okay, create a coons patch. I can grab everything and assemble the model again. Okay, zero lamina boundaries, so those holes are filled in. We're good there. And I'm happy. Now, the other thing I want to do is I want to think about 
kind of simplifying the geometry, defeaturing it, if you will. Um, for this uh, calculation, again, what we want to do is we want to uh, we want to optimize the shape of the spinner to reduce drag for the aircraft, and we probably don't need to have all of the uh, the control surfaces disconnected from the model. Um, that's going to add a lot of complexity, mainly because there are very small gaps between the control surfaces. That's definitely, I, I should mention, that is not a problem at all. But what it will do is it will increase the cell count a lot um, because we want to properly resolve what's going on in the gap region. So rather than go through that process, why don't we just heal that? We'll basically defeature the geometry by removing the control surfaces, and then we can focus on what we really need to. Okay. If you wanted to do something with the control surfaces, um, for example, they are a model, so I can uh, I can actually rotate this. Let's do like rotate about you know a curve, say like 15 degrees or something. So I can do control surface deflections. I can put this thing in an aileron roll or something like that and study those effects as well. But for the sake of simplicity, let's just merge all those together. And again, rather than doing the whole thing, let's split it in half first. So I'll create a plane. I'm going to pick models that are on that plane and trim by surface. Pick that plane as my surface. Imprint. And then I need to align it with the Z direction. And I can get rid of what I want. Actually, maybe I should have done this first. Um, one of the things actually that was brought to my attention before when I was showing this was uh, it's preferred that it's aligned with the x-axis. And so you notice that uh, it's actually aligned with the z-axis. So I should probably rotate this thing first. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to take the aircraft, and I'm going to rotate that. It's not necessary, but I thought I would show you how you could go ahead and do that. So I'll line it up with the x-axis. Okay. Oops. Need to grab everything and do that. Okay. There we go. Okay. So now what I want to do is, um, if you look in... Uh, any of your aerospace engineering textbooks, you'll notice this even kind of looks a little wrong. I know it's hard to see, but Y is pointed up, Z is pointed out of the wing. I kind of want to rotate this one more time. I want Z pointing down, and I want Y pointing out of the wing. So I'm just going to grab everything and rotate this again to something that I'm more comfortable with. All right, so there we go. Z is pointing down, Y is going out of the wing, X is going down the axis of the aircraft. So now I'm going to split this thing. Are you actually selecting the model there? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm selecting the models to do the split. Yep. All right. So now I'm going to align it with the... Uh, x-axis and do exactly what we did for the transport. Now this isn't necessary. What I'm doing, I'm kind of showing you some of my best practices having uh, having done a lot of this, a lot of these geometries. If it's symmetric, I don't want to have to work with the whole thing. That's double the work. Uh, <clears throat> um, so that's why I choose to kind of split it from the beginning, work with half of it, and, and do it from there. One of the reasons I like working with the full model initially is because when I create a solid, it has zero lamina boundaries. If I were to use this from the beginning, I'd have a bunch of lamina boundaries along my symmetry. So if there were any other small ones that were introduced somewhere else, I wouldn't be able to easily identify them without running a script or something like that. OK, so there's my, uh, my aircraft. So as I mentioned, I want to fill in the gaps so we can have a single element uh, rather than uh, have this aileron sitting out here. So I'm going to demonstrate it for the main wing, but the process is the same for the tail. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some geometry. I'm going to create some curves. Um, actually, before that, I'm going to... Oh, go ahead. Um, if you're trying to create an actual 3D, like a geometry that is not a symmetry plane, but actually is um, 
have these full aircraft, would you still cut it in half and then like uh, mirror it there? That's, yeah, so the question was, if I wanted to study the full aircraft, would I still cut it in half? Um, yes, I'm actually going to do that with this example. So, the, the, again, the benefit there is I do a lot of um, by-hand refinement work, and I only want to do it for half of it rather than the whole thing, and then I can just copy and paste it to create the rest. And there's also a mirror on export option now, so you can uh, effectively create just half your mesh, um, the volume and everything have a symmetry plane and then on export you can choose your mirror plane and it'll create the copy on the other side on export so you don't have to carry around twice as much data and point wise. Will it remove the symmetry plane yes. from the boundary mm -hmm. condition list? Yep, exactly. I believe the way it works is you don't set a boundary condition on that plane. Is that correct, John? Okay, yeah. So the, the way that would work is you would just leave that domain unspecified and it would remove it. So we were just doing that last night. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> All right, so I'm going to delete these uh, these surfaces. Um, why am I deleting them? They're actually no longer necessary because I'm going to heal that gap up. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some curves so I can create the surfaces I need to patch the gap. Like I mentioned before, PointWise is not a CAD package, but we have those those tools available so you can do things like this and not have to go back to your CAD package. Okay. Or go to your CAD guy. Alright. So I'm gonna set this up so I can just pick some curves and database boundaries and grab that. Create a Coons patch. So down here. Create a Coons patch. Let's see. Grab those. Hit those. And now I'm going to just grab everything, do what I did before, assemble models, create assemble, and now I've healed my wing. Is there any way when you're creating your like a little scripting to think about what you want it to do continuously? Don't believe so. I don't think those options exist. All right, so at this point, what I want to do is, let's just uh, move that back up there, shade everything so you can see it, is uh, the other thing I noticed was that my wing doesn't have a slit down the leading edge. And I'm going to want that so I can have additional refinement on the leading edge to resolve that curvature. So the easiest way to go ahead and do that is to create a curve on the geometry. So I can come up here and say curve on database. I can create a database curve, and when I move my cursor around the screen, it highlights different surfaces. So I, I basically want to just draw on this surface, so I select that, select two endpoints, I get a curve across the front, I can pick that quilt, and I can say trim by curve, that curve highlights in green, and I can imprint that and basically split that surface in half. And so now when I highlight it, I have a surface for the upper portion of the wing and one for the lower portion of the wing. And probably the last thing I'll show here is uh, just some basic quilting like we did on the, uh, the transport model. So I can grab, for example, all the, uh, the quilts for the upper surface and join those together. I can grab all the quilts on the wingtip and join those together. Um, maybe, for example, uh, on the fuselage, I would want to join those together. So just kind of selectively defeaturing the geometry by creating larger collections of quilts. All right. Well, after you've done something like that, if you want to split the quilt again, can, can you do that? Or? Yep. The, all the information is retained because, uh, again, it's just information sitting on top of all of the original entities. So, for example, if I took that quilt, I could go to the split, and you'll see all of the original boundaries of that quilt, and I can split it back up into its components. Great question. All right. Um, Okay, so the last thing we're going to do is we're going to create the, the spinner, just an approximate representation of the spinner. Um, as I mentioned before, not a CAD tool, but we can do revolves, so why not? Let's create something that looks like a spinner. So I'm going to create a curve. We'll start it there, and I'm going to rotate this, so I'm looking down the, say, positive Y. Oop, negative Y. There we go. And I'm just going to kind of sketch something that looks like a spinner. So it's a Bezier curve. 
I'll move the endpoint around. Pull control. Okay. So that looks like a nice curve for a spinner. So let's create a revolve um, point. Pick the endpoint. Let's say we only need to revolve at 180 degrees. Okay, so we can rotate this around and see what it looks like. And now we have a spinner. Um, if I highlight that, shade it, that's what we have. Okay. Now that looks uh, pretty bulbous. Um, if I reduce that a little bit, so I'll show you some scaling operations you can do. I can take that, I can uh, transform it and, and scale it. Let's scale it about the nose. 0 0.85, 0 0.85, 0 0.85, just in all directions to make it easy. Okay, something like that. You can delete the original curve. Now, what I want to do is I need to uh, I need to intersect it with the aircraft. The easiest way to do that, and the most robust way, is to pierce it. So I'm just going to take this and I'm going to transform it. I'm going to do a translational transform from that point, and I'm only going to transform it in the x direction, so body x. So that'll only let my cursor move in the x direction of the body, which is nice. So I can kind of go from there and then uh, get it to pierce the, uh, pierce the body. And then I'm going to translate it in the, uh, the Z direction a little bit until I'm kind of happy with it where that is. And in fact, it's, it's kind of where I would want it to be. So there's my spinner. Now all I need to do is just trim my model with that spinner. So I can go edit, trim by surface, pick the spinner as group B, keep only the outside imprint, and there we go. And now if I grab everything and create my model, it assembles into a nice water type model. Now I have a kind of an approximate representation of a spinner and I can let the optimizer and, and the mesh deformation kind of do the work for me. All right, but the last thing I want to do is I want to create an actuator disk. Um, there's a really easy way to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut where I know the prop is, which is at an X location of negative 400. And I'm going to take that and I'm going to trim by a surface, imprint, and then I'm going to create kind of the skeleton of my propeller. So it goes from that location to a uh, Z location of I believe negative 227. So this remote control aircraft is spinning a 14-inch uh, prop, so that's about the size of that. And I can take that curve and do the same thing. I can do a revolve operation. Um, about that point to create the disk and then uh, shade that and you can see that we now have our actuator disk. Okay? And I'll show you how you can set up the boundary conditions for that disk uh, before you export it to SU2 as well. Alright, so at this point we're done uh, cleaning up the model. So does anybody have any questions before I start with the surface meshing? I have a few online questions. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll toss you the first one here. So Devin asks, where can we find the initial geometry of the planes? Um, it's on GrabCAD. Um, I believe I have a link to that. So if you want to forward me that email, I can send him the link. I've also uploaded the grid, the final grid, to the FTP site. So he could probably extract the clean geometry out of that. Can you just show that uh, FTP site? Uh, I won't be able to show. Oh, I can show you the link. Uh, yeah. Go ahead and do that. Right there. Okay. Travis? Mm -hmm. So, if the, you know, in the wings, in the, in the vast design, the wings will be generated as a wing generator for me. So, you have a fuselage generator, wing generator, and then you know, um, you know, define parametric grid between them. So if you were taking that one step forward with the thing, so the big part would be is like the curvature. You'd have to get the curvature figured out uh, for the airfoil shapes and how you're scooping them. And then um, I, I'm basically asking about the proceduralization of the mesh based off of the proceduralization of the geometry. Uh, the question was, how would you proceduralize the mesh if you had proceduralized geometry? It would all be tied to a name. That's how I would do it. 
So as long as the wing came in the same every time and there was a, a surface called like wing upper surface, wing lower surface, I would know how to parameterize the geometry or the mesh based off of that. So assuming I could create it. Curvature, that's the important part. Of it. I could do it off of curvature, but uh, when I create the surface mesh, you'll see exactly how I go about doing that. Got a couple more okay. uh, on here online. So Marco asked, "How do you control surface mesh spacing for different different quilts?" Um, I'm going to cover that in the next section. <laughs> okay, that's easy. And then one more from uh, Yushio. They ask, uh, "You've shown how to combine geometry quilts. What if the geometry is not divided the way you want? Say you have a, a leading edge quilt separate from the upper and lower surface quilts." Leading edge quilt separate from the upper and lower surface. Well, you can do kind of what I did. Um, I would imagine, yeah, you'd have maybe like a quilt that just covers the leading edge and then one on the upper, one on the lower. You could split that uh, split that leading edge quilt along the leading edge, um, and then you could join those two, that small resulting quilt with the upper surface, then the other one with the lower surface. So you could effectively simplify it to something like this, just using some of those trimming operations that we uh, went through. Yeah, good question. Good question. Because of online for later. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. So here's the uh, the cleaned model. Um, 